Mental Health Matters. I'm Shannon Elliott. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome two guests in a discussion about children and psychiatric medication. Dr. Ken Braslow is an assistant clinical professor of psychiatry at UCSF, where he supervises residents and teaches parent-child psychotherapy. He is a graduate of USC Medical School. Dr. Braslow also completed a residency in adult psychiatry at the University of Texas and a fellowship in child and adolescent psychiatry at UCSF. Rosa Warder is the Family Relations Manager at Alameda County Behavioral Health Care Services. She has nearly two decades of experience in health education campaigns and interventions. She is also the mother of five, one who has lived with serious mental health issues since childhood, and another who developed symptoms as a young adult. She is still advocating for them. Welcome, Rosa and Dr. Braslow. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks. Thank you. Rosa, I'd like to start with you. Um, you, told, you were telling me your son's story over the phone a couple weeks ago, and I was just so moved by it. Could you tell us a little bit about the experience, um, his experience with mental health issues and your experience as a parent? Certainly. Um, I was working in health education, so I had some advantage of at least understanding medical terminology. But I had a son that um, was extremely active, very talented at school, sports, etc. And then when he became um, 12 years old, he went through a, a serious depressed period, and we took him to see a, our psychiatrist in our mental health carve out. And the psychiatrist wasn't there, but they had um, somebody, a counselor there, look at him and check him out. Um, they did not ask us any questions about his, his history, medical or behavioral. And over the phone, he was prescribed an SSRI, which is a um, serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, also known as an antidepressant and within three days was in the hospital in full psychotic manic state. We entered the world of mental health very rapidly and prior to the Mental Health Parity Act. So it was a, a very turnabout experience for the whole family. And can you briefly describe what the Parity Act is? Um, parity is that when you have a health insurance that mental health services such as hospitalizations or outpatient care, individual group care, et cetera, would be covered just as it would for any other illness, such as mm -hmm. if my son had had leukemia or a brain tumor, um, the people at admissions actually told me maybe he'll be lucky and he'll have a frontal lobe brain tumor, but we don't cover mental illness. So over years, many parents got together in California and we got the Mental Health Parity Act um, passed here, and then a few years ago it also became federally so um, without asked. having insurance for him at that time, how did you guys navigate the system in, of care and ultimately get the care that he needed? We navigated by just pushing and pushing, um, making sure that they understood that we understood that he had an illness, that this was not just something that he was doing because he felt like doing it. Um, we talked, we really, even did, though we didn't know about strength-based services at the time, we were really focusing on what his strengths are and what he could do and not so much on what this reaction was and we were pretty clear um, after a few nights of me researching with another friend um, that it was the um, SSRI that kind of mm -hmm. launched him into mm -hmm. his illness at full speed. Um, we did not end up having our health insurance cover anything that was inpatient. So we ended up with a little over half a million dollars in, me in medical bills. And they would just come, you know, in the mail, we put them on the refrigerator and just start laughing. You know, it was $98,420.16 and it was usually the 16 cents at the end that made us kind of go into hysterical laughter. Yeah. So, so how many, that was all from hospitalization, was also from um, doctor a, visits? A hospitalizations primarily, there was very little follow-up care until I was able to get him um, help through the county mental health system by going through the schools, the IEP mm -hmm. process where you do an individualized um, education plan and they see if there's mental health needs that can be helped by county mental health yeah. work. So he did use eventually county services including a residential uh, treatment stay, day treatment, counseling rich programs, um, all through childhood and through high, um, transition age youth period and he's now an adult. Um, he'll be 27 this summer. Wow. So Dr. Braslow, what criteria do you use for diagnosing children? Well, there's the official criteria which is the DSM manual, but um, when you're working with kids, you're not just working with an individual, you're working with a whole family, and you're looking at their school and their environment. So while you are looking at their symptoms in the way that you would for an adult, you also have to look at the big picture. Mm -hmm. And so the criteria in the DSM are mostly similar and for as for adults, and most people think that that's not really an 
totally accurate reflection of reality. But uh, the field of child psychiatry has only been around for a little more than 50 years. It's not been one that's been uh, had the time to flourish like some of the other medical specialties. Mm -hmm. So the research that's gone, uh, gone into these um, diagnoses is relatively recent. So hopefully o over time as more research is done, um, the diagnoses for kids will become more clear. Yeah. Is there a minimum age that you require before you even consider medicating a child or consider medication? There's no standard in the field for that. Uh, I personally feel uh, very hesitant about prescribing to kids who are under age seven. Uh, it's very hard to tease out what is normal developmental behavior from sure. uh, a condition or sure. an illness. Uh, however, I have seen some families where um, they are on the verge of crisis. Um, the child's being expelled from school at age four or five. If the family is coming apart at the seams because they can't manage the child, uh, then I would consider medicating, but only in the context of all the other interventions that we would also be making that are non-medication based. Yeah. Rosa, what kind of issues or questions did you struggle with in the treatment process, both medically as well as, you know, in your own personal life? Well, I think um, an important part of the treatment process is getting a true diagnosis. And getting an accurate diagnosis for a child, a teenager, or, or a young adult is a very difficult process. Mm -hmm. And it really needs to, um, you need to have the time to go through and get information about the child and how their behavior is in a variety of settings, so home, school, Maybe if they have a coach for a sports team at a neighbor's house, grandparents, et cetera, to mm -hmm. get a fuller picture of how the child reacts in different situations. Mm -hmm. So I think getting that really clear-cut diagnosis is a big issue. Um, unfortunately, one of the things that I have found is that people have been prescribing who may be physicians but may be are not psychiatrists. Mm. And I think they don't get that background and that the proper assessment does not occur, mm -hmm. and that's where we have problems. Mm -hmm. Dr. Braswell, what has research shown for uh, effectiveness in child medication or medication for children? So there's been some studies that are non-drug company funded that have been high quality, but not many. Uh, and the stimulant medications, those are like Ritalin and Adderall, and those mm -hmm. are used for attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder. Probably the most research has gone on in those. Um, there has been a study um, done in the mid-2000s looking at teenagers mm -hmm. on Prozac, and they're continuing to follow those kids now. Uh, but you're right, in terms of uh, studies on young children, very, very hard to do for multiple reasons. Uh, one is that once a drug company gets FDA approval for a medication, they don't really have any incentive to go get another FDA approval for kids. Mm -hmm. uh, doing studies is very complex and expensive. Mm -hmm. And um, on the flip side, it's also a lot of parents are understandably reluctant to enroll their child in a study. Uh, so, Chance it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so there's a lot of factors that go into it. But um, so the research for the um, ADHD medications mm -hmm. is also controversial in how you interpret that data. Mm -hmm. um, what the, they followed kids for 14 months in that study and they gave them the uh, families a choice of medication, therapy, medication and therapy, or just um, whatever they were doing before they were in the study, keep mm -hmm. doing it. And the research showed that at about 14 months, about 80% of kids responded to either Ritalin or Adderall mm -hmm. in, a, in a useful way. And that if you added on the therapy component, the kids who had therapy, and this was very intensive therapy, it was weeks and weeks of parents meeting with a therapist mm -hmm. and a child meeting with a therapist, coming up with behavioral plans, um, and other techniques to improve their focus and organization. Um, those kids did better, but they didn't do quite as well as the kids on the medication. Mm. And if you looked at the kids who were both on medication and in therapy, they, they did about the same as the kids who were, who were just on medication. Mm. In some areas, kids did better, like um, uh, family and social skills. Mm -hmm. But for the core symptoms of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, they didn't actually yeah. do any better. Mm -hmm. So I think th that, when those findings came out, that really pushed the field in the direction of, hey, mm. this is just a medication thing. Mm. It's a, a brain-based neurological or, or neuropsychiatric disorder, and we should be treating with medication. 
that unfortunately just happens to fit really well with the insurance model, which is that nobody has time for anything. Mm -hmm. And so it's very easy to write a quick prescription. Um, that doesn't always mean it's the best care, yeah. but it works out that way in a lot of settings. So the eight-year data, so they've been following these kids all along. They stopped at 14 months and they said, okay, we'll go back to wherever you were and keep um, keep going and we'll keep following you. So it's really hard to interpret the eight-year data because they wasn't controlled, they weren't actively intervening, but it showed that there was not so much benefit from staying on the medications long term. And how to interpret that is really controversial. Some people would mm -hmm. say, see, these medications really aren't doing anything. Some would say, well, these kids were getting bigger, and as you get bigger, you need more. Mm -hmm. And were they, who was managing the medication, mm -hmm. and were they only being seen for five minute med checks? Mm -hmm. In the study, they had the, the gold standard for treatment, but um, most kids are followed by pediatricians or right. primary care docs, and they're very well-meaning, but they may not have the background in it. They may not have the time in their clinic day. So it's really hard to interpret that data. Yeah. So that's um, uh, ADHD in a nutshell for the, um, the MTA study, which is really the, the best study that's been done to date and is still ongoing. For antidepressants in kids, uh, not so much in kids, but in adolescents, um, there have been a couple of studies that c have come out that are fairly high quality, and they have shown that pro they typically look at Prozac. Prozac is the only FDA-approved medication for uh, antidepressants for young kids mm -hmm. and teenagers. So, mm -hmm. um, so they looked at Prozac, and they have found that, yes, kids have gotten benefit from it um, more than placebo, and that, but they also get benefit from therapy. Mm -hmm. And if you do both, then it's even better. So the data has been encouraging in that regard, but there's also been a lot of data about the risks of the medication sure. coming out, and it's, it's really tough decision to weigh the potential benefits potential risks when the risks are so, as you experienced, are so potentially devastating. So every decision it has to be in individually based. Sure. So building on that idea of risk, and this is a question for both of you and your experience, um, what would you tell parents to watch out for if they decide to go the child medication route? Well, I would really want to make sure that families spoke with their psychiatrist, their child psychiatrist, and really looked at the whole picture of what was going on with the child as I said, across many different parts of their lives, mm -hmm. um, and also really look at other alternatives that might help reduce some of the behaviors, which are mm -hmm. basically the symptoms are behavioral. Mm -hmm. um, so looking at not only medication and counseling, and, and possibly both together, I really believe that in many instances, both together is, is an mm -hmm. uh, important part in terms of even learning to parent a child that's having difficulties, but also looking at um, Alternatives such as uh, changing things in the diet, and nutrition, um, possibly increasing exercise, basic self-soothing breathing techniques and things could be really helpful mm -hmm. for anybody at any age. Um, and really just making sure that you really have gotten a thorough assessment of what's going on with the child so that you feel fairly confident of the diagnoses. Mm -hmm. Having that contact and the consistency with your psychiatrist and having that support and ongoing dialogue is really critical. If you've got somebody who's just going to write a script based on what they see in front of them in a 10 minute visit, you need to leave the office. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's unfortunate <laughs> to hear about that. Um, so when I meet with families, I do really thorough evaluations. They can take hours to mm -hmm. do, and it's un challenging because there's not a ton of child psychiatrists, and if each mm -hmm. evaluation takes hours to do, then it doesn't leave a lot of availability. So. I think I understand why that happens out in primary care, but it's that doesn't mean it's acceptable. So when I work with families, we'll always talk about all of their options, both medication and non-medication, and you're always weighing the risk-benefit ratio mm -hmm. of any intervention or no intervention. Mm -hmm. There's a risk of no treatment also. So um, all of these things, uh, it, the, th the things you're alluding to, diet, exercise, there is great data on how well those work. It's unfortunate that so few people actually <laughs> take advantage of it, uh, but um, so those things can be useful. When we talk about medication, we talk about how important it is that parents call me if they have any concerns. Mm -hmm. I think that when there are bad outcomes uh, that's often because uh, families haven't been educated about what to look for and then have no idea where, where 
to do about it. So um, when I work with families and we're doing a, a prescribing an antidepressant, then I will educate them and the child about if they're feeling more irritable, if they're feeling more energized, if at all uh, developing suicidal thinking, mm -hmm. then we're just gonna go ahead and stop the medication mm -hmm. right away. Mm -hmm. um, but if you don't know that, and you think, well, maybe we're supposed to keep going with it, or we're not really sure what to do with it. Mm -hmm. if, if things keep building and building, then that's when things can get away from us. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think it was good that you took action pretty quickly. Um, and, and unfortunately, in some of the bad outcomes, uh, people just don't know what to do, and they just keep going along with it mm -hmm. because they don't sure. have a better plan. Sure. But even with taking action quickly, with some people who, like my son, happened to have latent um, bipolar disorder happening, so it just sort of jump-started it. So even though we stopped the medication, it didn't stop the symptoms yeah. and the course of the disease, and it came on in a, a much more acute fashion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what are the most prescribed medications for children? The stimulants are yeah. uh, staggering <laughs> prescription rates. Um, so uh, and, uh, some of them, or many of the prescriptions, may be totally legitimate. Um, there's a lot of controversy, I, I guess, philosophically about what is ADHD and um, is it something that our society has imposed upon kids who have to sit in their chair every day and that may not be the ideal setting for them? Or has it been there for a long time and we just didn't have the terminology for it mm -hmm. and now that we have the, the language for it, a lot of kids happen to actually have that. So it's depends which perspective you're looking at. You could yeah. make the same argument for autism also. Yeah. Um, so the stimulants are very widely prescribed, uh, also because they work uh, in most kids and they're fairly well tolerated. So that's a hard thing yeah. to resist for um, a lot of families. Yeah. Uh, and then probably the antidepressants are the second most prescribed and then mood stabilizers after that. Okay. Rosa, what advice would you give to family members and parents uh, to take care of themselves during this process? Well, that's a really important piece because the whole family is impacted when someone is ill, regardless of whether it's a mental health issue or any other kind of, of illness. Um, it's important to get education and information so that you know what you're dealing with and what your resources are in your community. And joining a support group um, it can be a NAMI, National Alliance for Mental Illness support group, um, going to take classes about the particular diagnoses that has been given to your child can be helpful. Learning different ways to parent because you honestly cannot parent a child who has a serious mental health condition in the same way that you parent the rest of your children. Mm -hmm. Certain things simply react as triggers as opposed to being helpful. So um, it really does require families to get assistance from other people and see that they are not the only one dealing with this. Most families feel very isolated they get kicked, kids get kicked out of school. They may not be welcome um, to come as a family to whatever place of worship they're in. Mm -hmm. They become known as the, the strange family on the block. Mm -hmm. um, they could become very socially isolated themselves as well as, well as their child being um, isolated. So it's important to get connected with other people that have had similar experiences. Yeah. So for both of you, what advice would you give to parents who are hesitant or nervous about trying medication for their children? Well, I would say I don't blame them, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that most interventions um, can be tried first before medication, unless the circumstances are r really Severe. calling for it. Yeah, that there's lots of, uh, as you mentioned, parent interventions. I, I love working with families. I think there's um, that's good medicine in and of itself, uh, and all the um, psychological and environmental inter interventions that can be tried. If you've tried those, then it leaves you with fewer options. And I'd say that's why I spend a lot of time with parents answering all their questions and really giving them a sense of confidence that we can maybe try this for a day mm -hmm. <laughs> and see how it goes. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully the outcome you experienced won't happen <laughs> to that degree, but that they know that they can call me in the mm -hmm. middle of the night if they need to, mm -hmm. um, if, if, it, if it becomes sure. uh, to that level. So I think sometimes feeling connected as part of a process that they're not isolated um, can be useful. And just knowing what, what symptoms to look for specifically mm -hmm. with each medication. Yes, I, I would say if you're considering medication for your child, um, I totally agree looking at what are the alternatives. And if alternatives have not been even discussed, 
um, you've got a problem there. You need to really look at what the alternatives may be that can support your child and your family um, in the setting at home, at school, and in the neighborhood and socially. Um, if everything has been tried and nothing seems to be working and you are at your wit's end, having a really frank conversation with a psychiatrist who is willing to really disclose the information and really work with you and really go at the, you know, this, a very slow and careful process mm -hmm. in administering medication, I feel that at, at that time it might be really useful to have medication for ch certain children under certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. Medication can be a truly a lifesaver for some children in terms of getting through school, even if they only do it Monday through Friday, especially with the ADD, ADHD mm -hmm. diagnoses. But um, when you go into depression and mood disorders, there's a lot more risk involved in the types of medications that are being offered to um, mm -hmm. deal with those kinds of symptoms. So the discussions have to be longer, they have to be more thorough, and um, like the doctor has just said to us, there is such a shortage of child psychiatrists mm -hmm. that um, it's, it's really difficult to get psychiatry time, to even find one on your, your list of health insurance is more mm -hmm. than a notion. Mm -hmm. So um, not everybody is gonna be lucky enough to have so you know, this have kind of relationship general, that your patients are having. physician or pediatrician because there's no other option. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. How would you advise parents to work with other people in the child's life, such as teachers or babysitters or members of the community? That's a really critical piece. Um, you know, I think about this when, when someone has a child who has leukemia, for instance. Um, you know, everybody's dropping off casseroles and visiting the child at the hospital with the balloons and um, other treats and taking the siblings out for special time. That absolutely does not happen when somebody's child is in a mental institution. Mm. There's such stigma attached still that the family's very isolated and they don't get the support that they really need. And um, unfortunately, it becomes up to the family to educate their relatives, their family members, their neighbors, to work with their school teachers, to bring in advocates to help explain because they may feel too emotional themselves mm -hmm. to really lay out mm -hmm. what would be helpful, to develop behavioral plans for what if this happens, we'll try this, this, and that. Um, to me remedy things before they get out of control. They really have to become very knowledgeable advocates for themselves and for their children. And once that happens, once that barrier is broken and people begin to understand that this is not something that's just about, you know, lenient parenting or too oh, strict Failures parenting, parent, or, yeah. you know, yeah. um, which is often what is thought of when you see the child, you know, completely losing it in the supermarket aisle. Um, but it really is, has to do with an illness just as any other illness. Mm. Once you really get that education across to people, you can find who your support system is. And you might be surprised about who your support system mm. ends up being. It, some people will be able to take on that role and some people will not. Mm. Dr. Braslow, how would you respond to the claim of over-medication of children, particularly toddlers? There's been a lot of this in the news, and just because there's a lot in the news doesn't mean it's as prevalent mm. as they would lead us to believe. Yes. But, but what are your thoughts on that? That's really scary. Yeah. There are, there are toddlers who um, pr probably are um, destructive in the house and um, maybe making their parents feel like that they're, they're at their wit's end. Mm -hmm. And so there's lots of interventions that I would consider before medicating a yeah. toddler, um, including um, even having someone go into the home if necessary to really give the parents some hands-on yeah. um, strategies. Um, in terms of over-medication of kids, well, it's really challenging because it's hard to know where that's coming from. So there probably are some kids who are on medication um, for convenience uh, because the parents, the family, they don't have the time, the energy, or the ability to follow through with non-medication interventions. Uh, on the flip side, there were there's a lot of kids who have suffered and without medication, and if they get on it and their lives are much better, um, that's a wonderful thing. And for years and years, most kids were not on medication. That doesn't mean that most kids didn't need it. Right. So it's it's challenging to tease out. Um, I think you have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. But certainly the numbers um, nationwide, prescription rates are rising. And it's hard to really know, because I don't know every person who's writing each prescription and knowing why what their thought process is. And that's what I'd really want to know. Right. Rosa, what do you do in your professional role over Alameda County Behavioral Health Care? Well, um, actually due to um, the issues that have happened with one of my children, I began a family partnership program 
where we had family partners uh, trained to work with clinicians in a multidisciplinary team and work with the families and help them learn the things that they need to know and, and get the support and the community resources and navigate the system. Um, about three years ago, I took over as the uh, manager for the Office of Family Relations, and that's a much bigger project that's mm -hmm. working with um, building supports and education and um, all kinds of family um, work for all of the systems of care. So, for, so from the zero to five, children's, transition age youth, adult, and older adult. And so the meaning of family changes and the role of families change as the consumer or client ages and as the course of their recovery continues on whatever spectrum they're on. So our definition for my office of family includes anyone that the client or consumer considers their family. It can be parents, it can be aunts, uncles, cousins, neighbors, friends, roommates, whoever. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. It's hard to believe we've already blown through 30 minutes, but apparently we have. But <laughs> thank you both so much for being here and sharing your education and experience and um, sharing it with the world. So thank you. We really appreciate it. Thank you. If you or someone you know is looking for support with their child's mental health condition, you may want to consider the following organizations. The Family Education and Resource Center, or FERC, is a family caregiver-centered program that provides information, education, advocacy, and support services in Alameda County. You can learn more on their website at www.askferc.org. United Advocates for Children and Families is a nonprofit organization that specializes in the renowned Equip, Educate, and Support, or EES, peer-to-peer -peer training program. Learn more at uacf4hope.org. The National Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health specializes in public policy, research, and evaluation, technical assistance, and training and evaluation. Learn more at ffcmh.org. NAMI California has three Alameda County affiliates and is known for its Family to Family curriculum, a free 12-week course for family caregivers of individuals with mental health challenges. Learn more at namicalifornia.org. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time.